Hello, and welcome to the Washington Institute. Welcome to the Washington Institute. I'm Rob Sadloff, the director of the Institute, and I'm pleased to welcome you. Just one second. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. Um, I'm Rob Satloff. Welcome to the Washington Institute. I'm pleased to welcome you to this special policy forum update on the situation um, of the Israel war against Hamas. Um, uh, we, we come to you just as President Biden is about to depart from Israel after a lightning quick visit um, to, uh, to project sympathy and support in the course of this uh, conflict and to speak at great detail with the leaders of Israel, the prime minister, the war cabinet, um, uh, as they are considering um, uh, basic decisions about the next stage of this conflict. Um, we have uh, an exemplary panel with us here in Washington and um, in Israel. I'll turn to them in just a minute. Uh, before I do, I do want to um, urge all of our viewers um, when you have a chance after our session today, go online at uh, the Washington Institute's website to review two very important documents that we produced in just the last couple of days. Um, first is a statement by the senior research staff of the Washington Institute titled, is, titled Hamas Attacks, a Turning Point for U.S. Policy. Um, it is rare for the research staff of the Institute to make a uh, joint statement, um, but this is a moment to underscore the gravity of the situation and the impact it has for how the United States should view uh, this issue in the broader context also of the challenge posed by Iran and Iran's proxies around the region. I urge you to take a look at that. And then secondly, yesterday um, we published what I think is a very important and timely document authored by uh, Dennis Ross, David Makovsky, and myself that is titled Israel's War Aims and the Principles of a Post-Hamas Administration in Gaza. It is not too early, we believe, to begin focusing on what the day after the battle may look like and to begin planning for that, even as these decisions about precisely what uh, the Israelis intend to do are still being made. Um, so take a look at both of those documents. Now I want to turn to our colleagues. I'm going to begin first in Israel with my colleague Zohar Palti, the Institute's Viterbi International Fellow, former, very, former high-ranking official of the Israeli Ministry of Defense, Mossad, and the IDF. Uh, Zohar. Thank you so much, Rob. It's really great to be with you guys, and we really appreciate all the support um, we needed this day, those days. So as Rob said, uh, Biden was uh, here in a touch-and-go visit. He just came 11 o'clock this morning, something like, and right now in Israel it's like 6 p.m., like seven hours uh, trips, and he's already in these moments are going to Ben Gurion and to take off back to the States. If I'm trying to sum it as Israeli, what we felt that you have and we have an American U.S. president that he is a mensch. He was compassionate. He was sympathetic. He was hugging. He was a Zionist. He was amazing. He saw Israel in shock, in pain. Blood is boiling. But also he saw that Israel right now is united more than ever, mainly the IDF and the security forces. Um, we have determinations, we believe in ourselves, and um, we know exactly what we, what we have to do. And right now, we have to get into Gaza and to kill as much as Hamas leadership and infrastructure that we can. And we hope to do it fast. It's going to be messy. It's not going to be pleasant. But we're in a finding moment that we don't have other chance right now after the vicious, and I don't know, even... How, I don't have the, vocal, the vocabulary how to uh, express what we uh, faced over here at October 7th. We saw from the American uh, outstanding friendship, strategic one, the Ford, the USS Ford is already over here, the carrier, Eisenhower is on the way to the region. 
messages, strategic messages from the Americans, from you guys to the Iranians, not to mass, and of course to the Hezbollah, but mainly to the Iranians. The president promised us in his last speech, like uh, 20 minutes ago, much more ammunition for the Iron Dome. And um, uh, we said it, unpresidential um, support that is going to the Congress to support the states of Israel to be ready uh, to confront several of fronts. Our main offers right now, I'm doing it in a very brief and robust um, because we have a lot of panels over here. Our main effort is Gaza right now, but simultaneously we have to look, first of all, for the northern arena to Lebanon. Hezbollah is trying in the last day to challenge us. Lots of, um, let's say, terror incidents all across the border. But guys, this is not yet the Hezbollah. Hezbollah is not all in yet. It just kind of, I don't know how to describe it, but they want to share sympathy with Gaza. This is not real Hezbollah yet, and we hope that they're not going to get we are watching Iran, we are watching Syria, we are watching the Houthis, and mainly we are watching right now the West Bank, whether something will be raised in the West Bank. The two last um, um, uh, issues, one is the humanitarian one. Listen, the dilemma of Israel was whether to say yes to all the initiatives that right now we have before the Red Cross are in Gaza and so are hostages. Uh, or not. The cabinet just published a message five minutes ago that based on President Biden's request, we are not going to interfere to the Egyptians to pass humanitarian minimum humanitarian aid to Gaza. That's mean medical, water, and things like that. Not more than that. And the equation over here that we understand what the president is saying whether the Hamas uh, is holding us as a wild card. Our last issue is the event last night with the hospital. After we checked, after we took air photos, everything, we have no shred of a doubt that this was an Islamic Jihad rockets that was launched to Israel and hit. We published today, uh, a couple of uh, hours ago, um, a video about uh, UAV that is going above, and you can see that the uh, hospital is standing. There is a heat in the parking lot, but based on the crane that there is in the parking lot, it's not a bomb of an Israeli aircraft. If it was a bomb of Israeli aircraft, probably most of it. The second issue we released, very sensitive intel to everybody. We intercept the conversation of Hamas guys that saying, uh, guys, it was a mistake over here, meaning it's not us. They're taking the responsibility for themselves. So over here, I know that the damage was uh, done yesterday, but no doubt it was planned by the Islamic Jihad and the Hamas. And we don't uh, we don't think that there is so many casualties as they published, like 500 or something like that. Not the dozens is not tragic, but it's not us behind it. And probably the next days, there will be more and more events like that. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you very much, Zohar. If you please stay with us, if you can. Um, turning now to my colleague um, uh, David Makovsky, our um, uh, our Ziegler Distinguished Fellow and, and Director of our Caret Program on Arab-Israeli Relations. David. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, thanks for organizing this. Thanks to all of you who follow us. Um, and do follow us uh, for those who follow, are on Twitter, X, my colleagues and I are trying to tweet out what we think are the significant things of the day often. I'm at Dave Murkowski. My colleagues do great work uh, as well. But that please keep up with us as we try to keep up with this minute by minute. So, look, what I want to do is hit just a few uh, key points and then look forward to the discussion. One is kind of what would what did Biden try to achieve? Um, you know, how was the visit the message? What did he want to hear from the Israelis? Where did he want to buy time? What was the news of, of the visit? Um, so I would say in terms of the visit was the message. Look, it was clearly solidarity. What he just said in his remarks before taking off on Air Force One, you're not alone. Um, and this is the first time uh, that I think an American president has ever visited Israel at a time of war in 75 years. So it, it, the visit itself, I think, was significant that way. He talked about his obligation to Israeli security, his underscoring. Uh, he's been very clear since the start of this crisis and 
identifying with Israel to get rid of uh, the scourge of Hamas rule. Um, and by the way, he's really connected with the Israeli public in, in an incredible way. Uh, his, his empathy, uh, his moral clarity about who did this, which he repeated today about the unadulterated evil, his importance that this is about deeds and not words, sending the aircraft carriers and uh, Iron Dome interceptors and other things by air as well, his willingness to incur political risk with, with parts of his party, his identification with the state of Israel and, and with the whole idea of Zionism about uh, you know the, the stateless Jews or defenseless Jews. He's, he's hit every message and therefore it's not a surprise that there are billboards in Israel. Thank you, Mr. President. Right-wing commentators on Channel 14, which is Israel's version of Fox News, went on the air, you know, with a mea culpa. I'm sorry I ever offended you, Mr. President. I doubted your sincerity. I mean, it's a, this is one of these moments in the history of Israel that I've never, you know, that are rarely seen where uh, an American leader, or I remember the King of Jordan also, connect with the people of Israel, whatever the transactions with the government of Israel. So I think the visit itself was a sense of solidarity that I think cannot be underestimated. He also, the visit was the message in the sense of leaving no doubt about deterrence, that potential enemies, he kept saying, don't, you know, don't, don't exploit this tragedy. Here I have these aircraft carriers. They're willing to shoot down missiles, essentially. He didn't use that, that phrase. But uh, having two, uh, one, and Grant will talk about this, one there and one en route, it, it is extraordinary. And, and, and by the way, I think it impacts the ethos of Israel, which has always been defend itself by itself. Suddenly the United States is in the picture. Um, this is something that I think will have lasting um, impact on on the ethos, but also because there's more enemies, it's now it's it's now um, you know the chance of a regional war. So apart from the visit is the message. What what does he want to ask? What did he? I think he had a few questions. One is in his effort to avoid regionalization. I'm sure in his meeting with the war cabinet, he wanted to know about this the whole idea of a second front, which could involve American assets. And that is a new thing. Um, you know, clearly the U.S. and Israel and all the Arab states want to contain this conflict. No one wants it to regionalize. Um, you know, he had that line on the way out, you know, in his remarks, we will do nothing again, referring to the Holocaust, saying we did, we did nothing, you know, not anymore. So, you know, we stand with you, not just in spirit, but in, in, in presence. So I think the regionalization was a key question. Clearly, a second piece that I think that was key for him is the sense that has been also a theme of his about, you know, with the rules of war, you know, I, I, I support you, you got to get rid of Hamas, but how are you going to protect civilians? I think that's clearly also a, a message that he is hoping that uh, Israel makes that distinction. Um, a third thing was clearly the day after. Americans always want to know, Israelis are often focused on the military dimension because they have, they deal with the immediate security issues. Americans see uh, a military strategy is a component, a key component, maybe the most important component, but a component of a wider political strategy the day after. Where does this go uh, in terms of policy? And, and Rob mentioned the piece that he, Dennis, and I tried to put out about principles for that uh, administration, which uh, of an interim period uh, until the PA could return, which could take many years. Um, a third, another thing he wanted to do, I think, clearly in, in asking is, are you thinking about other fronts? You know, we're talking about a second front in Hezbollah, but is there could be a new front in the West Bank, in 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 East Jerusalem, among Israeli Arabs? Uh, it's clear that that is something that he wants to know if Israel is focused on. You know, the, the, there's been several rampages in villages. Could there be a few people who want to extract revenge? Is Israel thinking about that? And we've seen how this is all like like tinderwood. Um, you know, you you and in the wake of this hospital parking lot bombing, whether it's dozens killed or more, um, you know, it's clear that that protests pop up everywhere, and it's unclear this could be contained. So, Israel, have you thought about that? So, I think he's got. It's about the visit is the message. Clear questions to Israel on these variety of issues, and then I think there's an element of buying time too. I think he does want the hostage diplomacy to have a chance, whether it's working through Qatar. I assume is the is the lead fa uh, actor maybe a little bit Egypt a little bit of of, of Turkey. Um, he keeps saying he said it in, in his remarks on the way out. You know we have no higher priority. He spent an hour and a half on Zoom with these people with the hostage families. Now we spend time in person in Jerusalem. Uh, it is remarkable 
Uh, he wants to give time for the humanitarian provisions to take hold. Now that the Israeli cabinet committed to getting in food, medicine, and, and water, this is, this is a shift. And now we'll see if the Egyptians open up the Rafah crossing, at least for Americans and other foreign nationals in Gaza. So where was the news that was, the, and I'll conclude with this. I mean, I think a few points are, is that he weighed in on the hospital bombing. Uh, he said, it, it, at first he said it, it was the other side. And then when asked by a reporter, where's your evidence? He said, my data comes from the Defense Department. In other words, the Pentagon and others. So he, he's putting out the weight of the United States. It's not just Israel versus um, um, CNN or or some other media outlets uh, and the like. And I think having the U.S. weigh in, uh, we'll see if it reflects itself in the American media coverage. Now the United States says we have a view on this. Um, and I would say he he also made news in that, uh, you know, that he, you know, like he said, that, that you know, he also said, I want to give humanitarian aid to Palestinians of the West Bank. I think it was $110 million. Um, but I think, you know, the, the, beyond the news dimensions here, uh, it's clear to me that uh, the, the visit's the message. He only deepened the sense of, of uh, connection, a visceral connection, I think, with the people of Israel in a way that our, no American president has been able to do. Now, the, I just want all this to be said as, as, um, as a prelude to saying this doesn't mean the U.S.-Israel uh, uh, back and forth over the next few weeks is going to all be smooth. I don't think it will be. I think it will be tested. I think the relationship will, there'll be a lot of moments where, you know, that, that, but the key is, does the U.S. have confidence that, the Isra that Israel knows what it's doing? And I'm, you know, I think there's a lot of professional respect uh, among the Israeli and American militaries and in the intel community, the IC. I think that respect is there. But I think the question will be, will the political echelon on both countries be able to navigate what is certainly to be, uh, you know, very choppy waters uh, in the coming weeks? And I think for this president, there might even be an, a mathematical equation that your breathing space on the ground is connected to the humanitarian provisions. So we can make that distinction between Hamas that needs to be, whose rule needs to be destroyed and the innocent people. And this is easier said than done. So stay tuned. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, David. Um, I'm going to turn now uh, to my colleague, Grant Rumley, the Goldberger Fellow here at the Washington Institute, to look at um, uh, what the United States has done and is doing um, to enhance deterrence um, against um, uh, uh, bad actors in the region uh, and to try to prevent um, escalation on other fronts. Grant? Great. Well, thanks, Rob. Uh, thanks, everyone, for, for tuning in. It's a, it's a privilege to be up here with, with my colleagues talking about an important issue at a, obviously an important time. You know, on the on the defense side of things, I think the U.S. support to Israel is focused on three lines of effort at the moment. Uh, the first is uh, posture and our capabilities. Uh, the second is our sort of messaging, as as Rob hinted at, and then the third is uh, security assistance to Israel uh, in the form of replenishing supplies. You know, on the first, uh, Zohar mentioned it. Uh, everyone's tracking the Ford Carrier Strike Group. It's moved uh, from the Western Mediterranean to the Eastern Med. Uh, the Ford is our newest and most advanced aircraft carrier. It entered the Western Med uh, back in June. It's nearing sort of the end of its first global deployment, and that's why there's uh, the Eisenhower Strike Group, which just left Norfolk on way uh, to the Mediterranean, should get there, I would say, in, in the next week or so. And so I think you're about to see two aircraft carriers. Obviously, with, with aircraft carriers and carrier strike groups, you add a whole host of capabilities uh, to a theater from uh, from air defense to long-range precision strike to uh, to ISR, maritime domain awareness. It sends a pretty loud uh, message uh, to, to potential adversaries of the U.S. In addition to that move, you also saw several other moves uh, in the region. The uh, Bataan Amphibious Ready Group was moved from the Persian Gulf, where it had arrived back in August, to waters closer to Israel. The Bataan brings with it um, a contingent of uh, Marines and has more of an amphibious role to play uh, here. And so I think, 
that coupled with other orders for for various troops to be put on readiness to potentially uh, deploy to Israel or deploy to the vicinity and support Israel, it's a pretty loud message. And it's uh, it's accompanied by senior level visits uh, and repeated messaging from D.C. and abroad that other adversaries, other actors should not get involved uh, in the conflict. And so you saw Secretary of Defense uh, Austin visit Israel, CENTCOM commander visit Israel, uh, officials in D.C. have said anyone thinking of getting involved don't. The president has said that. And so the combination of, of plussing up forces and messaging uh, is, is intended, obviously, by this administration to deter anyone else from getting involved. Uh, the third line of effort is is the security assistance front. This is probably uh, one of the more tangible uh, effects on the battlefield right now. It's, you know, in the in the days after October seventh, Israeli officials uh, reached out to the U.S. and and requested emergency replenishment of a couple of key uh, uh, capabilities that included uh, interceptors for the Iron Dome, uh, small diameter bombs, JDAM kits, other intel sharing. Uh, and the, the U.S. answered the bell uh, right away. You saw you saw even Jake Sullivan said that the U.S. had had already sent interceptors, um, that cargo planes had started landing at Israeli bases. I think U.S. officials are pretty confident that within current authorities, uh, largely under the MOU with Israel, that we have enough of what we need to be able to answer uh, this this demand signal. Sometimes it's it's as simple as looking as at what's already on the books and accelerating that. And so, you know, for instance, Israel had an agreement with Boeing uh, in a direct commercial sale back in 2021 to purchase small diameter bombs. And Boeing looked at what was on order and and simply uh, accelerated the delivery, either a partial delivery or or just moving it up in front of the line. And so sometimes it just takes uh, industry, the Defense Department and the partner this case, Israel, looking at what's on the books and looking at creative ways to get that to them. And so I think uh, I think the administration is focused on on those three lines of effort. Uh, so long as the conflict remains uh, limited to what's happening in Gaza. And so I think long term projecting out what does our defense support look like? Obviously, the ideal scenario for the U.S. is that uh, other entities, other actors don't get involved. This is obviously the ideal scenario for for Israel as well here. And so uh, I think from that standpoint, you can expect to see a U.S. carrier strike group stay in the Mediterranean. Uh, we've had one continually there since December 2021 uh, because of the situation in Ukraine. Uh, I think you can also expect to see sort of uh, dynamic employments of uh, advanced U.S. capabilities uh, like fifth gen fighters. So we saw, you know, after Russia was uh, was harassing U.S. assets in Syria in uh, over the past few months, U.S. sent in a squadron of F-35s to the region to, to you know, counter Iranian activities and send a message to Russia. So I think the Pentagon will look at sort of uh, dynamic employments of those types of assets there to, to send a message that we can be on site, we can be on station in the event of, of an emergency and support our partners. I think you'll also see the messaging uh, also hammer that home repeatedly that you know, even if there's, you know, a tapering of presence in some way, shape or form that the U.S. commitment has not wavered at all. And then in terms of in terms of long term assistance, I think, you know, there's a realization in in, in the government that we will need additional funding uh, and perhaps some authorities uh, to answer the bell here. And I think you'll see the White House and the Pentagon and State Department go to Congress for uh, for additional funding, not simply to just sort of buy what's needed to replenish, but also to to get industry to to ramp up production on some select capabilities and provide sort of a pathway to long-term support for both Ukraine and Israel and other U.S. partners. And so uh, I think everyone in the in the government is is planning around this being uh, sort of a long uh, long haul and uh, and making the support uh, match the match the demand signal. Okay, very good. Thank you very much, Grant. Um, we're now going to turn to my colleague, um, uh, Rafael Omeri. Raif is the Gilbert Senior Fellow here at the Washington Institute. And uh, um, I know that he's been following closely um, uh, what is developing in various Arab countries and, and within the Palestinian political dynamic on uh, the situation between Israel and Hamas. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Rob. And I, what I'm going to try to do is present uh, what you said, Rob, in terms of how it impacts U.S. diplomacy and the efforts that we are taking there. First, I have to say that uh, Secretary Blinken has been doing an extremely impressive job, along with his team, 
They've been on the ground. They've been just jumping all over the region. Really impressive. But they have a very difficult job. And I will give you maybe a sense of uh, the different uh, factors that they have to work with. We have our own objectives in the U.S. when it comes to this, whether it's support for Israel and defeating Hamas, uh, as uh, was mentioned before, whether our uh, hostages that might uh, need us to engage with ba bad actors in the region. We have humanitarian uh, interest and the minimizing civilian casualties. We have the interest of maintaining stability in the region, not only in terms of uh, new fronts, but how that impacts our Arab allies domestically and their own uh, politics. And all of this within the context of uh, uh, planning for the day after and positioning for the day after. And we are dealing with an Arab world that I would say is uh, kaleidoscopic. Kaleidoscopic in the sense that it is fractured, but also in the sense that it's changing uh, constantly. Just to give you a sense of what are the different divisions in the Arab world that we are dealing with right now, you have countries that are pro-Hamas, like uh, Qatar. Before this war, they were pro-Hamas and continue to be, while others are anti-Hamas. Uh, UAE, Saudi, Egypt, that see Hamas as part of the Muslim Brotherhood and a national security threat. You have different considerations. If you're a neighbor, like Jordan and Egypt, then if you are a distant country. Different consideration. Are you a peace partner? Or are you not with Israel? And ultimately, of course, there's that one uh, category that's called Saudi Arabia that it has its own uh, um, dynamics. And in doing all of this, we also have to understand some of the uh, um, dynamics and some of the factors that shape Arab decision maker uh, decision making and to see how we can give them some leeway to manage their politics without uh, going so far as to put them in a place that is oppositional to our interests. An Arab guy, leader will have to ask himself, um, how strong is the domestic support for Palestine? How far can I go based on this? We saw images yesterday from Jordan and Egypt in the aftermath of the uh, uh, bombing that were very concerning. Um, how strong is the opposition and how much they're going to use this? In Jordan, for example, uh, I know the Muslim Brotherhood is calling uh, this Friday for protesters to go and uh, storm the uh, borders with Israel. Um, what are the national security? Uh, uh, interests, border security, refugee issues, uh, etc. And of course, how that impacts their own relations, uh, foreign policy, vis-a-vis -vis US, vis-a-vis -vis Israel uh, and others. And uh, all of this remand, demands maybe some common themes in our approach in the US, but also a differentiated approach to different uh, Arab countries. To give you a practical flavor of what this means, uh, when we talk about uh, the immediate neighbors uh, of, uh, of Israel, they face some actually immediate national security threats, in addition to the political threats that they have domestically. Jordan and Egypt are both extremely worried about refugee flows. Jordan remembers that they were uh, hosted uh, some uh, decade and a half ago, around a million and a half uh, Syrians, and they are still there, and the most likelihood will be there for a long time. Does that, do they want more? Does that uh, serve their interest? Um, President Sisi, today, I believe, speaking with the German Chancellor, uh, basically was worried that if you have Palestinian uh, refugees on the borders in Sinai, would that become a friction point with Israel? If they start using uh, violence against Israel and terror, would Israel respond on uh, Egyptian territory? Does this create uh, tension between Israel uh, and Egypt? Uh, uh, they look at issues of uh, border security and ultimately in the bigger picture, as they look at two state solution, they are concerned of the possibility of a uh, population transfer. They are concerned, you know, we can debate whether or not it is uh, well founded, but it is there and it's deep within both of these uh, uh, countries. So that's kind of one set example of some of the issues that we have to deal with. Then you have the Abraham Accord countries. So far, I believe, you know, Certainly, it is their interest and they want to maintain the Abraham Accord, uh, Accords and they're continuing to maintain it. It was remarkable that, uh, that uh, pardon me, uh, Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates, very from the get-go, were very clear in their condemnation uh, of Hamas. That was a very strong uh, signal, not only of their interest in maintaining the Abraham Accord, but also of the transformative nature of, uh, of this accord. Um, yet they do face domestic and regional uh, challenges. Uh, some of their regional uh, uh, opponents have already been blaming them and you know, accusing them of being complicit, etc. We saw the anxiety yesterday after the hospital incidents where all of those countries came out immediately and condemned it, uh, even for seeing the facts, because they wanted to be ahead of their own uh, uh, publics. And then you have the, uh, the Saudis. The Saudis, first and foremost right now, 
want to project leadership. We saw uh, MBS, the Crown Prince, uh, from the beginning, uh, contact the different Arab leaders. They're trying to be in a position uh, where they would uh, not lose their standing in the Arab and Muslim world as leaders, knowing that there are others who are challenging them for that position. They don't want to leave openings for these uh, others. They're at the same time positioning for the uh, what I believe is the inevitable uh, resumption of talks about normalization with Israel. The Saudis have been uh, attacked by many uh, of basically being soft on the Palestinians uh, when the talks were going a few weeks ago. I think what the Saudis are trying to show right now in their very strong and I would say robust and even at some points aggressive uh, position vis-a-vis -vis the uh, Palestinians, they want a message that uh, we are pro-Palestinian and positioned for the day. After and finally, this is all happening in the context of a tense relation with the United States improving in recent weeks and months, yet nevertheless, there are residues of the tension that we had between uh, the two leaderships. What does this mean for U.S. Uh, diplomacy? First and foremost, it means that we have to be very adaptable and very agile and understand that things can ch change overnight and to be very aware of our uh, the interests of our allies and ensuring that this does not destabilize them. Um, a part of doing this is to engage the Israelis on minimizing civilians. I think the president was extremely uh, clear from the get-go. Uh, democracies are stronger when they follow the rules of law. While doing, of course, doing it at a time that we do uh, that we support uh, Israel and, in particular, the aim of defeating Hamas. If Hamas emerges from this with any political win, I think the U.S. and all of its allies stand to uh, lose by this. Any wins that we get in the process, we should see try to uh, give them to our allies. Things like humanitarian corridors, access, allow our allies the ability to go to their publics and say that our relations with the U.S., our uh, reasonable approach is giving us the ability to shape uh, both the events and the day after. And finally, as we speak about the day after, as we think about the day after, and I fully agree with my colleagues, this is not too early for this. This we have to start thinking about today. We have to think of a setup that certainly empowers our uh, allies, gives a role to uh, the actors that we want to see involved. Uh, Jordan, Egypt, Abraham Accord countries, other uh, regional allies, and at the same time, ensure that we completely exclude any of uh, Hamas's uh, regional supporters, be it uh, Qatar, be it uh, Turkey, uh, and others. Very, very easy to lay out all of these things uh, in a presentation. Huge challenge for our diplomats, uh, um, and the days to come will provide even more challenges. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Ghaif. Um, I'm now going to turn to Naomi Newman, a visiting fellow here at the Washington Institute, and until recently, uh, the director of research unit at the Israel Security Agency, the Shin Bet, the Israeli domestic uh, um, intelligence agency that has had uh, that had responsibility for uh, Palestinian territories. Naomi, welcome. Yeah. Please. Thank you, Rob. Um, uh, with your permission, I will deal and focus on the Israeli side because um, I think it's uh, uh, we are in very uh, important moment that we uh, Israel now is uh, facing uh, a dramatic uh, uh, period of time. And um, it's already that I'm sure that in Israel is already thinking about the day after uh, Hamas. And I would like to reflect some of my thoughts regarding the role of Israel in this uh, uh, war. So um, it's still an um, ongoing uh, reality. We don't know uh, when and how this uh, war will end. But it's important, it's very important that in different places, and especially in Israel, we think about the day uh, after Hamas. Why it's important? It's important because um, the thinking of this uh, uh, question is actually define the rule, what we should do, what Israel should do, and what Israel shouldn't do regarding this war. It's also actually uh, uh, reducing the uncertainty, and this is another important uh, thing. So what Israel should do? Um, there's no doubt Israel should eliminate this leadership of the Hamas. Israel needs to destroy the military wing of the Hamas and its uh, military capabilities. Israel should leave um, a civilian address in order to um, uh, take care of the people of Gaza and uh, restore the Gaza, the infrastructure, the building the day after uh, the war. Um, we should we shouldn't remain in Gaza for a long time. We already know what the consequences of this uh, kind of activity. But in the same time, we should not allow Hamas um, to recover and shouldn't uh, let 
other threat to fulfill in a vacuum that should uh, might be the day after uh, Hamas. Another important thing is to recruit the Arabs country in order to um, rebuild the Gaza Strip from the uh, from the uh, start. Um, what will be the, one of the questions? I guess everybody deal with is what will be the uh, react of the Gazan uh, public. Um, so as long as we know that uh, over the years, uh, the Gazan didn't support solidly um, the Hamas. They preferred the welfare rather than the um, rockets and the uh, bomb. So um, according to uh, David Pollock uh, polls and the Khalil Shkaki, only 30%, between 20 and 30% support solidly um, a Hamas. And this give us kind of chance that maybe the public in Gaza Strip will uh, allow change, real change in uh, Gaza and bring uh, other leadership in order to improve the life of the Gazans. Um, another thing um, that we should ask ourselves, what is the role of the Palestinian Authority? Should uh, or can the uh, Palestinian Authority replace Hamas? I think, I believe that the uh, Palestinian Authority doesn't want and, uh, and can't replace right now a, a Hamas, mainly because it's still facing, uh, the Palestinian Authority is still facing instability in the West Bank, and there is a lot of um, uh, challenge that uh, the Palestinian Authority need to deal with. But in the long term, I think the Palestinian Authority, this is the solution for uh, replacing Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Therefore, the Palestinian Authority need to do quite a lot of changes, a lot of reforms, um, and we need to help um, the Palestinian Authority to be much more strong. And, uh, 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 and in a way, in a few years, um, the Palestinian Authority will manage to um, enter the Gaza Strip and take the control of the uh, people there. Um, another thing that uh, uh, we need to ask and to say, as I said before, the role of the Middle East state, they are a huge and crucial part of this. And I think in this, uh, um, we, we need their means, we need their attitude, we need their money to replace Qatar and do a huge change in the Gaza Strip. In the same issue, I must say that we know that the willing of Iran was to um, harm the negotiation between Israel and the Saudi regarding the normalization. If this relation or oh, normalization won't carried out in the next future, it will be the win of the Iranian and the win of Hamas and Hezbollah and the other um, um, actors that connected to this uh, camp. Um, I want to um, say another thing regarding the Israeli people. This war will affect and it already affect the Israeli people. We know what's happened in the Second Intifada. After the Second Intifada, the Israeli thought that there is no partner. partner. Um, I wonder if this war, maybe, or unfortunately, will show the Israeli there is no coexistence between Israeli and the Palestinian. And this is a so sad uh, um, um, factor. It will take years to actually to build, rebuild the um, um, trust between these uh, uh, people. Um, I would say another, talk about the, the current phase of the uh, war. Many people in Israel argue that it's not uh, right to uh, enter the Gaza Strip because Hamas is waiting for us and they uh, want to strike us in the minute that we will get there. And they talking about the price that Israel will pay because of this enter. And they're right, we were gonna pay a high price for this enter. But I think that the price for not entering the Gaza Strip will be much more higher. It's much, much higher because anyone who know Hamas understand that this attack was the first phase of the big vision. What is the big vision? To conquer the um, 
the territory between the river and the sea and lead this territory uh, under a Muslim uh, state. So if you won't face Hamas right now, we will meet Hamas in the next year. It will be much more um, uh, hurt, much with the prices, much more uh, higher. And other things that we need to say, if Hamas, if the, the um, um, leadership of the Hamas will come out the day after the war, and they will say we win, this will be the failure, the big failure and defeat of the Israel, because we need to show everybody, not only for the Hamas in the area and the, and the all over the world, that when somebody is without no reason strike um, Israel, in the end they find itself um, um, disappear or uh, illuminated. So this is another uh, uh, thing. I think that Israel need also to illuminate the, the uh, leadership of the Hamas because of the national resilience. I think that there is a contract between the Israeli and the government that if somebody struck you, or somebody harm you, we are going after him and we eliminate him. And this is the contract and we need to keep it in order to keep resilience. So this is the reason why Israel, although the prices need to um, um, illuminate Hamas and destroy um, the uh, military uh, uh, capabilities of the Hamas. So um, I don't want to say another thing uh, to, and to summarize it. These wars start with a savage attack of the Hamas, but actually is not, um, it's not a conflict, between, only conflict between Hamas and Israel. It's not also conflict between Israel and the Arabs, and it's not conflict between Jewish and uh, Muslim. It's a conflict between two attitude, two agenda, two ideology. One ideology that believe in a democratic, liberal welfare, and the other on fanatic and uh, uh, violence and, and non-freedom. This is the argument now. It is another argument here. This is different, uh, totally different attitude uh, regarding the meaning of life and death. I just want to quote Sheikh Yassin, and I recommend to read an um, uh, article of uh, Professor Lidbeck that talk about these things. Sheikh Yassin said, a couple of weeks before he uh, died, um, he said, when the Israeli um, so, uh, is a nation that grave life, so if somebody died in the Israeli nation, they cry. We seeking for, uh, for the death. So if somebody died, um, we are uh, happy. And this is the difference between these two um, attitudes. So um, in the bottom line, um, this, is start, this war starts uh, as a conflict between Israel and the Hamas, but it's um, much more behind these the geographical boundaries. It's a um, war between freedom, democracy, and welfare against opposed to um, darkness, non-liberal and fanatic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Naomi. All right, um, I understand, uh, Zohar, that uh, the rockets are falling in Tel Aviv as we speak. Um, uh, um, so let me just go to you because you may have to um, uh, run out um, if, uh, if the sirens go on where you are. Um, uh, uh, as we begin our discussion here, is there anything further that you can tell us about your understanding of the timing, scope, parameters of likely Israeli military action? First of all, everything is good over here. Iron Dome into South Africa, all the missiles, and uh, thank God. Um, time frame. We are preparing ourselves for at least half a year, if not more than that. Some people don't get it. It's not another operation. It's not something between us and the Hamas or the Palestinians or something. This is a war. And that's the time frame that we are uh, preparing ourselves. And again, all depends the uh, Israeli uh, decision makers on the political levels right now. First and foremost, we have to get in. We know uh, how we start. We, know, we don't know how it's going to develop. And as I mentioned before, uh, there is a potential for escalation in other scenes, and we have to be ready for that as well. So I'm not sure uh, where we will stand, let's say, in two weeks or two months from now, but this is our preparation for the time being. 
Okay, thank you. Um, look, as we go to questions, I just want to invite um, all of our viewers, if you want to try to get into this conversation, you can um, pose a question into the, the Zoom bar, the Q&A function of the Zoom bar, or you can email me directly at rsatloff at washingtoninstitute.org. Um, all right, David, let, let me turn to you and, and ask you a bit about um, uh, the, the different um, uh, pressures on, on President Biden, um, uh, um, um, how this has evolved over the last 10 days, and where you think his rather remarkable display of support, um, uh, sympathy, um, uh, backed up by military force, where you think this may be going for, um, for the president? Look, the president wants to know that these issues are addressed. You know, tell me that you've got a clear military strategy for a ground force that is not going to inflame things. Look at one hospital bombing. Look how it, it drove all these protests outside U.S. embassies and it's not over. And Israel didn't even do it. Uh, so I want to know I want to know about your military strategy and I want to know the military strategy is linked to a political strategy afterwards. And I want to know that on the humanitarian side, there really are safe zones. I mean, I think it is remarkable. We haven't mentioned this yet, but the fact that Israel told the North Gazans go to South Gaza and Hamas said, don't go and set up roadblocks. 700,000 people of the 1.1 1 .1, uh, in that's that's more than, uh, you know, more than half and maybe more than two thirds, uh, more than two thirds. Listen to Israel uh, and defied Hamas. So how is that humanitarian zone going to look like? Uh, and, you know, and, and clearly on the regional strategy, you don't want this to go outside the, re you don't want this, you want this contained. I want this contained. I, I want to know how do you avoid these other fronts? And, uh, so I, I just think that he, you know, if, if his ball starts firing, I have, I mean, Grant's the expert, not me, but I, I have no doubt that, uh, the aircraft carrier Dwight, the, uh, Gerald R. Ford will, will intercept it if needed. So I, I do think on basic things, he's going to stand with Israel, like he said. But if this ground war goes on long, and if a lot of civilians are killed, and if uh, American assets become more intertwined with that, he's going to say, hey, you know, I, I, I need to have confidence that you guys have, have, have a clear direction here. This is something, this is for our listeners watching this on Zoom and YouTube. This is something I think different than any war that Israel has ever faced. The, the intimacy with the United States is, is a blessing, but it's also a challenge because the U.S. might, you know, we might say, listen, we have, we have, we have assets on the ground here and what you do affects us. And um, so I think the intimacy on, 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 on the comfort level with the war planning is critical because if things go off the tracks, th this impacts America. So it's, it's the blessing and it's the challenge. It's something so different than anything we've seen, it seems to me, where basically we give Israel the weapons, Israel does all the fighting. Israel does not want Americans dying for Israel. I want to say that very clearly. Israel has always felt the strength of U.S.-Israel relations is based on the fact that Americans do not die for Israel. And no one's saying the U.S. is going to join the fight in Gaza. Definitely, we will not be joining that. But his second front on Hezbollah could complicate things. And here, too, I don't think U.S. is going to have any boots on the ground. I don't expect that at all. But I expect the U.S. could, we could be more inter, you know, twined. And therefore, our, our comfort level with Israeli war planning is, is going to have to be very, very stronger. It seems to me it's a higher bar than previous wars. So just on that, um, uh, before I turn to uh, Reith, um, uh, Grant, uh, um, we know that Hamas, that uh, Hezbollah has you know, anti-ship uh, missiles, has the capability sure, to sure. to hit American assets out of the Mediterranean. Um, you know, one one uh, you know shudders at the idea of, of of that sort of escalation, but it is not and uh, not at all an impossibility. Um, uh, what sort of assets are out there? What do you think might be you know a, a really negative scenario in this regard? Yeah, no, I mean it's it's a it's a, it's a good question. It's an important question, uh, uh, but it's 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 hard to contemplate, right? And so, I think you know, first and foremost, what uh, our presence, what our naval presence is looking at, is you know, what's the likely furthest range of those Hezbollah assets and capabilities, uh, and are we parked you know, within that? Are we on the outside of that? Are we able to 
is there a, a, a level where we can sort of see what they're doing without them ranging us or hitting us or putting our forces at risk? So that's just from a force protection standpoint, will be on all the commanders' minds out there. I mean, you know, there's what we have in addition to the, the carrier strike group, which comes with sort of the ability to to lay out a, a big a big radar picture, as well as uh, it comes with uh, a, a strike group that can that can conduct long range precision strikes. So these are F-18s. There's uh, there's growlers on board. They're able to, to go in and they would be able to respond uh, to any type of uh, to any type of attack. I mean, zooming out, the broader question that, that David was sort of hinting at is, you know, is Hezbollah deterred by the U.S. presence? Well, there's deterrence by denial and there's deterrence by punishment. Certainly with some of the destroyers that we have accompanying the carrier strike group that come with uh, ballistic missile defense, uh, we would be able, I think, to, to plug in and defend ourselves, but also defend Israel in that case. But if you're if you're Hezbollah, you might be thinking that you have enough firepower to overwhelm air defense systems uh, and, to, and to land some successful hits. If you're looking at deterrence by punishment in terms of uh, U.S. response, you may also be sitting there wondering, well, would the U.S. actually get involved uh, if if attacked or if threatened or if we open up this front? Uh, now, I would say I, I think this president of this administration would get involved. I think most of us would agree that uh, that the president cares deeply about Israel and that it's, has taken uh, really profound, proactive steps uh, in defense of Israel. But, you know, that's, you know, the enemy always gets a say. And so Hezbollah, that's an open question for them sitting there is, you know, could we get through uh, the U.S. defenses and the combined U.S.-Israel defenses, uh, and would we would we risk a U.S. response in return? It, if if things are are you know escalating in that direction, I think certainly to David's point, the U.S. has the capability, certainly with two carrier strike groups, to get involved and start uh, start going after some Hezbollah targets without having to put actual physical boots on the ground. Uh, but then the efforts to, to coordinate and co-plan with the Israelis become all the more intensive. All right, thank you. Um, Raith, I've gotten, uh, I've received uh, quite a few questions which are uh, connected to some of your remarks. Um, uh, uh, first, um, a lot of people are asking, you know, bad stuff will happen in this war. Um, we saw an example of this yesterday. It is now quite clear um, confirmed by American, uh, uh, by the White House and others, that responsibility for the um, for the tragedy at El Ahly Hospital is Islamic Jihad, um, an errant missile, uh, not an Israeli bomb. Why is it so difficult for so many in Arab capitals, leaders, commentators, observers, normally rational people? to discriminate and say, yes, we can criticize A, B, and C, but this was not, this one was not Israel. Why is that so difficult? Yeah, look, uh, part of it relates to how do you shape public uh, opinion? When we saw with the incident yesterday in the uh, hospital, the first wave of commentary um, and reporting was very clear in uh, pinning it on, uh, on Israel. So that already created a public uh, uh, mood. I have to say, until today, I see also some uh, media outlets that have an interest in promoting this. Look at Jazeera today. I was even I even saw like articles, you know, saying that this and that American munitions were used in this uh, attack to try to basically drag us into uh, uh, this issue. So that's kind of part of it, and it's always uh, difficult to counter this. Uh, clear narrative with, you know, sometimes sophisticated and time-consuming uh, information. That's one. But I think the deeper question was actually political more than uh, anything else. And political in the following uh, sense. You know, uh, if I were sitting, say, in Amman or Abu Dhabi, etc., before I ask myself, is this accurate or not, I would have to ask myself, how my how is my public uh, going to react? And I think in all of these capitals, they say well, very clearly, that their own public was just uh, uh, going to accept a certain narrative. Now, do you go and confront your public at a time when you already are feeling uh, so many pressures, when things are already so unstable? I think many of those countries decided that uh, they wanted to basically be ahead of their publics and write this one out rather than just go into a confrontation right now. All of this said, I'm actually, uh, I was, you know, 
pleasantly surprised this morning, at least on some uh, outlets, uh, particularly those that are Gulf-based, uh, Saudi, Emirati, uh, etc. While they did not go clear in terms of in terms of this, I think they don't want to confront the public yet. They're starting to raise questions, so we're starting to see this. But again, these countries have to be very aware of their public opinion and how their uh, statements are going to shape their public opinion. Particularly that as this go on, uh, this uh, uh, operation goes on, they know there'll be many such moments in the future. Personally, I would keep a close eye on what happens this Friday in Jordan, Egypt, and other places because. Uh, that might be the moment of uh, real confrontation between some of these governments and their publics. Friday being... Uh, the, the, it's the Friday prayer, the midday prayer, where basically thousands upon thousands uh, just leave the mosques at the same time. And that's traditionally the time where big demonstrations uh, uh, take place. As I mentioned earlier, for example, the Muslim Brotherhood in Jordan are calling for the worshippers to go and storm the borders. That's going to be a tough one. Um, before I leave you, I have a lot of questions just on the specific issue of the cancellation of what was to have been the other piece of President Biden's Middle East trip, namely going to Amman, the capital of Jordan, and there meeting uh, the King of Jordan, the head of the Palestinian Authority, and the President of Egypt. Um, it didn't happen. Um, what's the calculation of Mahmoud Abbas and of King Abdullah in, uh, in, in not going forward with this? I mean, it's sometimes hard for us from Washington to appreciate the amount of public anger at things like this. Again, I, I would uh, urge everyone to go and look at some of the footage of uh, demonstrations in Jordan yesterday, right after this, when it, in front of the Israeli embassy uh, or elsewhere. In uh, Ramallah, there were demonstrations against the Palestinian Authority, uh, throwing stones, etc., at the presidential uh, uh, compound. For these leaders, it was very clear that this is a domestic, political, and even security uh, crisis. It was also very clear that this might end up uh, being, uh, especially for the Jordanians, might uh, create additional uh, security challenges. You know, imagine again the uh, footage of Jordanians clashing with uh, security forces uh, or Jordanians protesting Biden with Jordanian security forces. So they felt things were too, uh, um, how shall I say, too, too unpredictable. I believe the administration handled it well, uh, framing it as part of, you know, the uh, mourning for the victims. By the way, Jordan and Egypt, uh, at least these two, maybe more, have declared official mourning for three uh, uh, days after yesterday. So we approached this in a, also a delicate way that was very sensitive to the challenges that our partners uh, had yet it raises a bigger question in terms of the ability of uh, Hamas to scuttle such a high level of uh, diplomacy and how we should now start thinking of when the next incident happens. And I'm sad to say, uh, tragically, it will happen. How will we confront it as opposed to simply reacting as we did this last time? Um, and briefly, David, uh, um, the impact on the president of his diplomacy by the cancellation of the Arab part of his visit? Well. We don't know. I mean, he's um, he's someone when he says he's going to talk to these leaders on the phone for him. Foreign policy is often personal relations between leaders. I will say it meant that his stay in Israel was uh, another whatever, two and a half hours. And every meeting he had with the Israeli cabinet, war cabinet, like he had more time because he wasn't rushed to, to get to Amman. But uh, I do think he sees the Arab leaders as actually on his side. Uh, when it comes to avoiding regionalization, containing this conflict, um, you know, I think it, it might be more challenging uh, on on the refugee issue, the, uh, the and uh, on the humanitarian side. But certainly, he sees the Arabs as as on on America's side and on Israel's side when it comes to avoiding regionalization. I don't think he took it uh, personally, uh, and he, he's been around for a long time, and I think he's going to keep those relations, and um, so I, I, I'm not worried about that. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Zohar, I'm going to come to you in a minute with a couple of very specific questions about possible Israel war aims, but first, Naomi, a, a bunch of questions for you about the other front, um, or the other Palestinian front, West Bank, Jerusalem, Israeli Arabs even, um, uh, 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 so far, relatively quiet. Um, uh, why? Is this because Hamas hasn't tried? Because the PA has been effective? Because IDF and the PA together have been effective? Why 
has this front, which exploded two years ago in conflict, why has it been quiet during this huge conflict? Um, Into the mic, please. Yeah. Uh, as I said before, I think that um, um, regarding the Palestinian arena, um, if you look at all these uh, Palestinian communities, when I'm talking about the Eastern Jerusalem, the Israeli Arabs that also see themselves as Israeli and Arabs and, and the West Bank, I don't think that they um, identify what was Hamas did. I'm, 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 I can see the announcement of uh, Mansour Abbas and the Islamic movement that say that we are not part of this. I think that you can see that the, uh, although there is a much more uh, terror attacks in the West Bank, um, still the people are not part of this. I think that, uh, in, especially in the West Bank, the people uh, there um, that uh, remember the Intifada understand that violence is not uh, uh, the tool in order to achieve welfare and achieve something uh, else. So therefore, I think that the action of the Hamas was so dramatic and so cruel and so that they, in, from the beginning, they thought it's not part of them. And deeper, I think they think that the violence is not an uh, opportunity at all. Um, so can, I think that when what happened and the, the uh, hospital was uh, um, uh, heard, they feel sympathy with the Palestinian after all, it's their brother and it's, it's looked, but this, they don't think that this is part of this, uh, of, of their mentality. They, they are referred to Daesh activity and not for Muslim Brotherhood, like in the Israeli Arabs, and not for the Palestinian agenda. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Zohar, lots of questions about Israeli possible Israeli military tactics. Um, Tom Friedman, for example, had a, a column uh, uh, yesterday um, which warned against going into Gaza. It is a trap, a booby trap for years by um, uh, Hamas planning. Um, it'll be a bloodbath. Why is Israel want to get drawn into um, urban warfare um, uh, uh, where the other side has an advantage of territory knowledge, um, et cetera. Um, uh, uh, I know that these are all factors that go into Israeli military planning, but when, 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 when you look at this, what is, what is your response to that, 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 that huge you know, warning sign that some people are, are putting up ahead? First of all, I have a great respect for Tom Friedman, and I think in the last year he was uh, one of the leading voices regarding the crisis, the internal crisis that we used to have over here. And uh, I really appreciate, uh, in this case, I think he's, uh, he's wrong. And because he's right now speaking in this uh, column yesterday, he's speaking about the strategy of the Israeli since Hamas took over Gaza. Exactly all the reasons that yesterday he drew in the article, that was our argument of the security uh, establishment in Israel to the political level and the political level, why not to do it? This time is a different ballgame. It was an earthquake. This is something big. That's the reason that we have to go in. And I think, Rob, that yesterday you and Dennis in your uh, brilliant uh, article, just phrase it, the targets beautifully. And I will just read the first sentence that you said. The most logical objective to Israel is to end Hamas control of Gaza. Forget about all the rest; they are important. But I'm not going to. Um, I'm not going to read all the that. Probably the people right now will read it as well. Anyway, this is the goal. Um, that Hamas is not going to control Gaza anymore. And I'm telling you, we will change the strategy, and we will do equation, and we are not going to let the Hamas to build the force again. And we will diverse everything in our capability in order to prevent Hamas to have the last, let's say, 15 years or even more that he's controlling Gaza, harming the population, strengthening, suffocating all the populations, and of course, doing uh, terrorist attacks against us. I want one word regarding the US policy. I said, whatever we thought about uh, President Biden's visit, was amazing, he's a true friend and everything. But uh, we also noticed today the letter that Mitch McConnell uh, just sent. And the fact that he was back up the president and he spoke in bipartisan, completely bipartisan voice, this is encouraging. That's mean that the Congress, the Senate, 
the House of Representatives are completely united and understand the challenges right now we're facing. And, we, and from here, I'm saying we are so grateful for the Congress that probably he will approve whatever the president uh, will bring to him. And uh, we don't take it for granted. It's something outstanding in America that America know how to unite in a crisis like that. Now, if we only had a, a speaker of the House of Representatives so we could convene. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, David, um, quite a few questions for you around the following. Um, Israeli domestic politics and this crisis. Um, uh, 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 can we can we already gauge the internal political repercussions? There are rising voices of serious centrists in Israel saying, let's not wait for the post-war for us to to uh, to judge some of our leaders who who made horrible mistakes. Um, we know that they were in charge for the last 10 years, mostly. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, uh, let's we, we need to make change now. Yeah. 15 um, years, 15 years. <laughs> um, uh, um, how is Prime Minister Netanyahu going to survive in the near term? And what are the political repercussions already that we can see from uh, from uh, from what is going on? Um, since uh, since October seven. Look, you, you know, you always have to, you know, judge with more than a grain, maybe a kilo of salt when polling data is happening in the middle of a crisis, because things could change between the middle of the crisis and the end of the crisis. So, you know, I'm saying that with a big caveat. Uh, Netanyahu's numbers are as bad as we've ever seen. I think uh, it's uh, his ministers going out. Uh, uh, the twice that they've been in hospitals that we know of, they've been shooed away by families at hospitals, uh, been booed at certain uh, other public gatherings. What you have a situation is that the chief of staff, uh, Herzi Alevi, the head of military intelligence, Aaron Khalifa, the head of the Shin Bet, you know, Ronan Bar, have all made public statements taking responsibility uh, for this uh, sense of operational surprise uh, of October 7th. The one person who hasn't done it is the prime minister. Uh, now he has very thick skin. We, we joke that an elephant has Netanyahu skin and a cat has Netanyahu lives. So he's been counted out before. It might be too soon. I was very happy to see that he invited in two people uh, who we know very well at the Washington Institute, Benny Gantz and Gadi Eisenkot, former IDF chiefs of staff, who uh, leaders of the centrist party uh, of the called National Unity to be part of an, a, a more unified government and war cabinet. Five people, uh, you know, are these, these include Netanyahu, his right hand advisor, Ron Dermer, the defense minister, Gallant, who was also a deputy chief of staff and two other military, uh, you know, chiefs of staff, Eisenkot, Gantz and Eisenkot. I think that does give the public a sense of confidence uh, that uh, that there's an effort to broaden out. 80% of Israel wants to see a unity government. I wonder if Yair Lapid will join. He has conditioned his his inclusion in in Netanyahu uh, dismissing the hard right, uh, Smotrich and Ben Gvir. I don't see that happening. He'll say addition, yes, subtraction, no. Uh, there will be voices saying right now uh, people should resign. I think the Israeli ethos is uh, wait, wait until the war is over. The war is the priority. That's number one. Uh, we should say anyone who saw the movie Golda uh, Meir, we could debate some of the historical veracities of some of the point, but she wasn't named in, in even the Agronaut Commission after the war, and yet the public felt a certain anger against her, and she ended up leaving office anyway. Uh, it took a few months. It didn't happen during the war itself, however. So I don't think anything will happen during the war. I think the Israeli professional leaders showed professionalism by taking that responsibility. Tzachia Negbi, I should add, the national security advisor, went in front of a microphone and said, hey, we had this warning at 4 a.m. We didn't know if it was an exercise. It was a holiday. I thought maybe we, you know, we all thought we should wait. And he also took responsibility. So I do think it's it's the strength of Israel, as, as Naomi has said, is its resilience, its ability to overcome adversity. And the fact that these leaders 
um, you know, have come forward, I think is a sign of Israel's strength. And it's a sign of the unity of the country that people say the priority now is the war. There's going to be time for a lot of finger pointing after the war is over. And so, we're, but we're in the eye of the storm right now, but it doesn't mean that the political storm won't begin after the military uh, storm ends. All right. Thank you very much. Um, just a couple of, uh, of military questions for Grant and Zohar about the issue of using your assets and resupply of assets, mm -hmm. say using interceptors and resupply of interceptors. It's not always easy to, to match up resupply from when, they've, when they're needed. We don't actually have a Congress right now <laughs> to approve various things, or at least we don't have a functioning House of Representatives, as David said. <laughs> so um, uh, 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 do you have what you need? Do we have the authorities to supply what they need? Sure. Is that going to be matched up appropriately? Zohar. Based on all the conversation in the last 10 days, and there is constant um, conversation online between uh, the MOD and the Pentagon a couple of times a day, um, the White House and the Prime Minister Office, IDF, with General Kurila, right now, Commander of CENTCOM is in Israel. And um, of course, he's speaking with the chairman, our chief of staff. Uh, the American is sending a lot of supplies, and the chain is working beautifully. And uh, it's only the beginning. And uh, what the president just said regarding replenishment, uh, iron dome interceptors, it's so important. Um, I just want to remind that the president already gave one and a half years ago while I was in the office, a uh, billion dollars to uh, interceptors, and it was in, pro in on, on process in the last one and a half years. And right now, probably we'll uh, add more to that. And as uh, Grant said before, the president over here of the Americans and on the president, I don't remember something like that for many, many, many years. So the answer, the short answer for you, uh, Rob, the answer is yes. We are having a lot of uh, equi um, equipment and so far we are doing good. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I agree with Sohar. I mean, I, I think obviously we, uh, you know, the, the priority is on the nearest gator to the boat and supporting Israel in this in this crisis. Long term, you know, I think the administration is already thinking about ways to keep this up. Sohar pointed out earlier that they're planning on at least six months, uh, uh, if not longer there. And so you're going to have to think through how do you keep a steady drumbeat of support going? Uh, the U.S. has has you know plenty of plenty of authorities. There's there's different avenues. We could use the presidential drawdown authority. There's a stockpile in Israel of U.S. munitions that uh, that special relationships like with Israel or with South Korea countries are able to sort of tap into. Uh, Congress could look to to appropriate above uh, what the MOU agreed upon in terms of FMF uh, and other missile defense. Uh, the administration could also look at emergency arm sales, uh, sort of uh, working with Congress and, and bypassing a review period. So there's there's plenty of, of, of sort of long term avenues there. And I think you see the administration uh, reflect that in, in the in the plans to draw up a big budget request um, or a supplemental to Congress that, you know, that 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 becomes a political equation, too. They want to include funding for Ukraine, for the border, for Taiwan, in addition to funding for Israel. And so that will get uh, into into a bit more of a, a political fight here. But ultimately, as, as Zohar pointed out earlier, there's broad bipartisan support. Uh, there's support from the administration. There's, I think, plenty of avenues to make sure that our support to Israel is enduring. Thank you. Um, and lastly, uh, uh, Reif, um, there have been recent uh, efforts, statements by Iran and, uh, and Iran's um, allies uh, calling on Arab states to um, uh, uh, to sort of relive 1973 Arab oil boycott of Israel this time, not of America, although who knows where that may go, um, uh, and other uh, calling on other and calling on Arab states to to impose other penalties, um, uh, uh, cutting peace treaties with Israel, removing ambassadors from the five countries that have uh, relationships with Israel. Are you seeing any receptivity to those sorts of suggestions from uh, Arab governments? Um, Arab public discussion of these topics. Uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, first of all, if I may just add a word about the West Bank. Um, I agree with uh, what Naomi said, yet uh, 
uh, relative stability doesn't mean full stability. I saw uh, reports yesterday of around 60 people killed uh, since uh, the 7th. Uh, I can't verify the number, but things are happening. And as we learned actually on October 7th, these horrific attacks is calm and stability are not the same thing. And things I believe in the West Bank remain very volatile. To your question, you know, there's a very simple answer. We're not in 73 anymore. Um, the region has changed dramatically in that period. I believe the new wave of, uh, of uh, leadership in this region is prioritizing the issue of domestic interest, local interest, national interest for a country like Saudi Arabia, for a country like uh, UAE, etc. Yes, they should put this to show sympathy and they have been showing sympathy to the Palestinians. But the bottom line is domestic interests. And I don't see them using uh, issues like oil, uh, which is key to their own strategies, uh, to their own position not only economically, but diplomatically in the world as a tool uh, for something that is ultimately not their fight because uh, they're, they're very, know very well. Look, when they hear from the Iranians, not only the Iranians, by the way, also Hamas is being saying uh, the same thing. They know that the only objective is to embarrass them and to pressure them. I do not see them ever falling uh, for this. I don't see them ever fulfilling an Iranian agenda uh, because of this, because they know that part of the reason that Iran uh, was interested in pushing this conflict is, is specifically to hit some of their interests. That said, I can see some symbolic moves. I can see, for example, uh, withdrawal of ambassadors, but not shutting down uh, embassies, uh, things uh, of this sort. One thing to keep an eye on, and I think, and I do feel uh, a lot of sympathy for them, is the United Arab Emirates, which happens to be right now the Arab leader, uh, the Arab member of the UN Security Council, and they will be under tremendous pressure, not only from the Iranians, but from actors like the Syrians, like uh, the Algerians, uh, etc., to take a position. And uh, yet, I see them ultimately uh, prioritizing their own national interest here. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone here. Um, I want to thank this uh, remarkable crowd that has been with us online throughout, both on Zoom, uh, YouTube, and, and, and any other platform you can watch us. Um, if you're on Zoom, uh, we posted the links to those two documents I mentioned um, at the top of the hour. Um, uh, we posted that in, uh, in the chat. You can, you can see it there. Uh, please go to the Institute's website, www.washingtoninstitute.org, for a full array of analysis about what is going on, about our recommendations for U.S. policy, about our assessment of uh, what is going on throughout the region and the potential for escalation. I want to thank my colleagues um, here in Washington, Rachel Omari, Grant Rumley, David Makovsky, and Naomi Newman, and, and in Israel to Zohar Palti. Thank you all very much for joining us at the Washington Institute.